Greetings and peace, everybody. I hope you and yours are doing well today, wherever you might be watching this from. Now, the Masonic education subject that I will cover for today is the Shams Tabrizi poems. He has this great book, all of these sayings called 40 Rules of Love. And the 40 Rules of Love, what I will do is I will read the entire book for you. Plus, I will give my own interpretation from my Sufi and Masonic perspective on what he's trying to teach the reader or those that are on the path. So I hope you like what I have to offer. And again, thank you. This is something new that I'm doing in terms of reading something and interpreting it. So I hope you like it. All right, let's do this. All right. Okay. All right, just give it a minute. It should be good now. Okay, there it is. As, as you see the whirling dervish here, experiencing his love for Allah, God, the grand architect of the universe in his own way. And that's what the seeker does in his life is to find that oneness with divinity in whichever way you might perceive it. So this is the 40 rules of love by Shams Tabrizi that make up the true essence of life. There is this saying that love happens to us while we're living, but the truth is life happens to us while we're loving. But we're just so preoccupied with the nitty gritties of everyday life that we forget to choose love. Every single day we forget that love in fact is the truest and purest essence of the life and time we spend in this world. We leave nothing behind except the love we leave left behind as memory. And that's exactly what Shams Ab Tabriz taught Rumi before he came to known as the poet of love. In his bid to live a religion of love, Tabrizi swore by the 40 rules of love, and we should too. You may have come across these in a book of the same title by Alif Shafak, but in actuality, the 40 rules of love predate even Rumi's lifetime. So choose love, love, and life will follow. And this is beautiful, the annotation from the, uh, from the author, that the aspect is that this life that we have, this human life, we're too busy chasing after money, degrees, titles, but the real reality is what good did you do for yourself and others? That's the real spiritual wealth that you will carry with you in the next life, including the aspect of love. And also with what the aspect of Albert Pike is what you do for yourself, it basically dies with you and what you do for others in the world is that's what immortalizes you is the aspect of love. So starting with the first quote, how we see God is a direct reflection of how we see ourselves. We don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. If God brings to mind mostly fear and blame, it means there's too much fear and blame welled inside us. If we see God as full of love and compassion, so are we. Now, this reminds me of Omar Khayyam's um, quote that heaven and hell, I myself am both heaven and hell. And that's true because in this reality, if I'm projecting, if I'm in a state of uh, low vibration, low behavior, I'm doing negative behaviors that are not putting me in a good state of mind in terms of connecting with self and the divinity, then that's the reality that I will project into the external world. But if my internal temple, if I'm projecting a reality of love, compassion, I'm grounded, I'm not doing any low vibration behavior or any low vibration activities, then that's basically, you are the maker of your reality in any ways. And I mean, even in masonry, you're taught that you get out of masonry what you put into it. Same with life. Life is what you make it. And the Sufi aspect, I myself am heaven and hell. Or that I tried to find God, I only found myself. I tried to find myself, but only found God. So ultimately, you are given this choice on what kind of life do you want. So as long as you have that intention that I, I want to take responsibility I want to make things right. I want to work on myself. I want to get things right. Like the mason chips away at his rough ashlar until it becomes the smooth ashlar. And even Star Wars, the master of the way, the Jedi, 
The Jedi is an Arabic word, al Jedi, meaning the master of the way. So that's what you're becoming in the process is the perfect Ashler Stone as the Mason, the perfect Sufi, the perfect Jedi, all one and the same. But it's your internal reality. If you want to stay in a state of, um, of, I guess, chaos and division, then that's what you're going to project in terms of your experiences. But if you keep yourself good, loving, kind, compassionate, then that's what you will get. And that's what uh, the first rule is teaching us. All right. So the second rule, the path to the truth is a labor of the heart, not of the head. Make your heart your primary guide, not your mind. Meet, challenge, and ultimately prevail over your nafs. Not nafs is the lower self in Arabic. With your heart, knowing your false ego will lead you to the knowledge of God. So this is basically saying that it's the aspect of the alchemical transformation of man into lower qualities into higher divine qualities, from your base metals into gold. And that's ultimately you have to follow your destiny. Let your heart be your guiding key. Right. It says that in the Holy Quran, that almighty God is closer to us than our jugular vein. Different scriptures also tell you that kingdom of heaven is within. Whatever you're trying to find, whether it's through organizations, teachers, venues, ultimately, who is the one that comes with the epiphany and knowing and knowing what's right for you? It's you. You find that in your heart through your experiences. You put two and two together and you decide what's right for you. And you feel much better when you listen to the intuition of the heart. And even in the Kingdom Hearts games, there is truth to what they're telling you. Let your heart be your guiding key. Because your heart is where it's that it's connected with Allah, God, the Grand Architect. And that's what will help you find that oneness of divinity and unity. Now, why is the human heart under so much attack right now with division, chaos, hatred, violence? skyrocketing across metropolitan cities across America and across the world. Why? Because the agents of chaos were also in all races, religions, and groups want to attack the human heart. So we are desensitized and we feel less compassion for one another. That's um, one of their goals is to divide the human family. And ultimately, when you're trying to find your way in life, whether it's through masonry, Sufism, whichever path uh, that's taking you to the destination, that is it's taking you because it's all different paths but one mountaintop so you ultimately have to follow your heart and as long as that path is helping you become a good person it's bringing light to your life then that is for you then that that is the path for you just like in hinduism in the gita it's krishna says that whichever path you follow it all leads to me so ultimately one of the 99 names of allah being Al allahat everything is one Everything is indeed one, and then that's what you follow. Okay, so the third one, the third rule of love, you can study God through everything and everyone in the universe, because God is not confined in a mosque, synagogue, or church. But if you are still in need of knowing where exactly his abode is, there is only one place to look for him in the heart of a true lover. Now, this, this makes me smile because growing up, I always saw the oneness of God everywhere. Coming to America, five years old, I would attend Quran classes, Bible classes, same day. I would go to the local Sikh or Dvaras because I realized everyone was teaching you the same exact thing. With all of these different faiths and philosophies, they were basically a code of conduct. They were all telling you how to live a good, clean life to respect self, others, the world around you, the aspect of divinity in their own way. And that's exactly what it is, but it's your heart. Because I do know also that there are those that pray five times a day. Some of them are not good people. They're cheating people in businesses. They're being hypocrites. They don't practice what they preach. I call, I call all of them out, whether it's, even if it's you know, in, in, in my own. So you do have to call out those who are not practicing what they preach. Even those that go to church every Sunday, some are not good people. It's not about where you're going to worship every day that defines if you have the love of God in you. It's about your ideals, your ethics, your practices, and how, what kind of life are you living, right? Everything, when, you, when a man or woman puts God first in their life, like in masonry, 
always trust God, right? Always put your trust in the grand architect and everything shall go good for you. It's the same aspect. Find it within your heart. The heart is such a powerful place that um, it's such a powerful force that binds all of us together that it cannot be stressed. While we're looking for God here, 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 God is basically in a place where you would least expect inside the human heart or in the heart of a true believer. So that's exactly what it's telling you. Become true believers. Well, this reminded me of Stan Lee's quote when I used to play his Spider-Man game back in elementary school days that welcome true believers, those who believed in uh, Peter's story and him, him overcoming the odds in his life. But there is the power of belief that does carry you in your heart. All right, moving on. Intellect and love are made of different materials. Intellect ties people in knots and risks, risks nothing. But love dissolves all tangles and risks everything. Intellect is always cautious and advises. Beware, too much ecstasy. Whereas love says, oh, never mind, take the plunge. Intellect does not easily break down, whereas love can effortlessly reduce itself to rubble. But treasures are hidden among ruins. A broken heart hides treasures. So this is basically telling you that sometimes in your life, if you're always cautious all the time, if you're always worried about, oh, what's going to happen, or you try to basically hide yourself from the world, or what can be, or who, what, where, why, all those things, you're never going to get to experience life. So sometimes you got to listen to the heart and take that plunge into the ocean. Because the aspect of maktub, which is also stressed in the alchemist book, if you read the alchemist, that Santiago, no matter how much adver adversity he had to go through, what his destiny was, nobody could take that away from him, of ultimately finding his love, Fatima, finding his treasure, finding his experience, becoming the master that he was meant to be. So when something is written for you, you can't just hide in your home all day thinking that, oh, I just can't go out there and face the world. Sometimes you got to listen to the bravery of your heart and make the efforts to take responsibility and do the right thing. If you need to work on yourself, work on yourself. If you need to exercise, get yourself in shape, do it. If you need to go see a therapist to get your mind in order, there's no shame in that. Do what you need to do, listen to your heart, and face the world and embrace your destiny. Just like how the Mason is taught to achieve all that he can within his life in terms of knowledge, experience, and achieving the oneness of this life, that this one life that the grand architect has given you. Make the most of it while you have it. All right, moving on. Most of the problems of the world stem from linguistic mistakes and simple misunderstanding. Don't ever take words at face value. When you step into the zone of love, language as we know it becomes obsolete. That which cannot be put in words can only be grasped through silence. But this is telling you now we live in a society where everyone's kind of um, misunderstanding each other, misquoting each other, taking things out of context. Nobody's taking the time to sit down and understand with each other. There's all these divisions going on. People are fighting about this party or this race or this religion or this uh, centric mindset or this centric mindset or this bias or that bias. So this is a uh, reminds me of the aspect that there is one human family. We have this point within the circle, which is the grand architect of the universe, Allah, God, in whichever way you perceive it. And everything around that circle is a tapestry of different colors and patterns that is supposed to be celebrated, not condemned. I see people arguing online. They're just uh, reading something just to reply to it while not putting yourself in the shoes of the other person to understand their point of view. What is it that is making them talk like that, right? With all the stuff that's going on with the race stuff and everything, take time to put yourself in the shoes of others. What did they experience that I didn't experience? Or how can I sit down on the table of brotherhood and talk with them and get to understand them? And this is what it's saying. Now, this was written like a thousand plus years ago, even before Rumi, because Shams was Rumi's teacher. And 
to this very day in the post 2020 world, we're still talking about this, that people misunderstand each other, they misquote each other due to their own confirmation biases, their own cognitive dissonance. We've got to take time to understand each other. That's the main thing. Okay. Loneliness and solitude are two different things. When you are lonely, it is easy to delude yourself into believing that you are on the right path. Solitude is better for us, as it means being alone without feeling lonely. But eventually, it is the best way, best to find a person who will be your mirror. Remember, only in another person's heart can you truly see yourself in the presence of God within you. It's like in Sufism, you have a, a sheikh. There's a tariqa, there's a silsala that you have to sit with somebody who has sat with somebody, et cetera. So there's this chain of line that goes with you, just like in masonry. You sit with the elder brothers and then they sit with you and mentor you and guide you. Then you pass that tradition on and so on and so on from one generation to another. So in the West, this is an Eastern knowledge that's being given to you. In the West, you always have this aspect of individualism that's promoted. Just worry about yourself. Don't worry about others. Just throw people under the bus if you have to. If it's not benefiting you in any way, then it doesn't concern you. But realize this too. Look at the stories of Jesus, Muhammad, Solomon, Moses. Peace be upon them all. They couldn't get to their objective by their own self. They needed their brethren, their companions, their disciples, and all the people that guided them, guided them along the way. We are all walking each other home, and we all owe this love and light to one another. There is truth in that. And this is telling you that sometimes you have to follow those that are companions, your mirror reflections that share the same ideals, same pathway of life, same everything that you resemble in your life, whether it's a female companion, male companion, whichever way in direction that life is taking you. You have to know that sometimes you can't walk this road alone. You will find those that will come and help you and love you and respect you. It's like the Masonic aspect. Many in the West don't understand how powerful Freemasonry is outside of their small town lodges, but it's a universal ideal where I, ran, I know because I travel the world, I've been to other places where wherever you go, there's always that support of brotherhood. There is that presence that's always there with you. And that comforts you that no matter where I go, I always got people looking out for me. That's such a good feeling to have. That's what the Sufi tradition is teaching you as well, that you need those mirror reflections in your life because that's ultimately where our life takes us. All right, whatever happens in your life, no matter how troubling things might seem, do not enter the neighborhood of despair. Even when all doors remain closed, God will open up a new path only for you. Be thankful. It is easy to be thankful when all is well. A Sufi is thankful not only for what he has been given, but also for all the things that he has been denied. Now, this reminds me of the story of the Sufi Sheikh who entered into a car and uh, he was with his disciples and students and the car was on the road. And they got a flat tire and the sheikh immediately said, Alhamdulillah, all praise is due to God. And the disciples were in the heat of the moment because, you know, you're on the road and the tire goes flat. What are you going to do? And they would say, sheikh, why are you saying that? He said, you know why? Because this tire being flat, God or the grand architect saved you from a different disaster where had you had gotten behind that tractor trailer, then that would have been the end of your life because there was an accident that you were being saved from. So when, e even in um, masonry, you have this aspect of trials and tribulations that there will be, you have this journey and you have to go through it. And all the stuff that's there, like a, a diamond being polished, sometimes you has to go through the rough phases of life. If you don't go through the rough phases of your life, how would you learn your lessons? You wouldn't be who you are today if it weren't for the bad times the times where you doubted yourself, where you put yourself down, uh, others put you down, but you rose from it like a phoenix in the ashes, stronger than ever. Just like a Sufi does, he thanks God in good times and bad times, knowing that both come from him. The Mason, he puts his faith in God, knowing that he's chipping away at his rough ashlar to become smooth. 
through the trials and tribulations. So embrace it. Embrace all moments in your life with positivity and conviction, and nothing in this life can touch you. I guarantee it. Patience does not mean to passively endure. It means to look at the end of a process. What does patience mean? It means to look at the thorn and see the rose, to look at the night and see the dawn. And patience means to be short-sighted as to not be able to see the outcome. The lovers of God never run out of patience for they know that the time is needed for the crescent moon to become full. Now we live in a society of instant gratification. I need it now, I need it immediately. I need it to satisfy my curiosity and need at this very moment. But not knowing that in your life, whatever it is that you're trying to achieve, you gotta work for it. You can't get a degree in one day you got to work for it. There's a gradual process that builds up year one, year two, year three, year four, and then you get it. And then look how good you feel when you go through that hard work. When you're losing weight, you can't lose it in one day. There's a time, one month, two month, three month, four month. So anything in, in your life you do, you make a game plan. And it's with consistency, with good intention and an effort that you go through it and achieve it. And I was in a position, I could put my own story here, that I was in a position in the a, in a summer of 2018, my waist was 43, I was in bad health, I was in debt, I didn't have money, I didn't have a job. And it, things kind of just seemed impossible that I was stuck under this big avalanche of mountains. How was I gonna get out of it? I looked myself in the mirror that day and I said, I'm gonna stop running away from my problems. This was like before I did YouTube or wrote my book or any of this stuff. So I, I realized that, okay, now I'm going to look at myself in the mirror. I'm going to make a game plan. It's going to take me some time, but I'll get things straightened out. That time next year, it took me 12, a little over 12 months. So I had to be patient. One month, two month, three months, so on and so on. I gradually had a vocation, cleared all my debts, had money got my health in order mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally. So I was in the process of a Sufi and a Mason going through those trials and tribulations to become the smooth Ashler from the rough Ashler and to get close to Allah, the grand architect of the universe. And I was able to appreciate things more had I not, had I not gone through those things on a deeper scale that your average person could not. So I'm thankful for that. Because if I wouldn't be who I am today if it wasn't for that. So embrace all of the blessings and lessons that do come in your life with patience. And whatever it is that you're trying to achieve, you shall. But be patient with yourself as the temple is not built in a day, right? All right. East, west, south, or north makes little difference. No matter what your destination, just be sure to make every journey a journey within. If you travel within, you'll travel the whole wide world and beyond. So this is telling you, you got to look within. No matter where your journey takes you, you got to look within yourself. Sometimes it's like the aspect of finding God within your heart. You're looking here, you're looking there, you're looking over here, or you're going to the east, or God is everywhere, omnipresent, all-knowing, all-seeing the aspect of al-Basir, one of the 99 names of Allah, that no matter where you go, God is always watching you. Masonry, the eye of the grand architect is always upon you. The story of the Sufi Sheikh who gave his disciples the three chickens said, go and kill it where nobody can see you. The first two did it in their house, one in the forest. The third one said, I couldn't do it. Everywhere I went, God was watching me. And that's exactly what it is, that in each direction, find that epiphany within. All right. Beautiful lessons, right? Beautiful book and lessons by Master Shams Tabrizi. The quest for love changes us. There is no seeker among those who search for love who has not matured on the way. The moment you start looking for love, you start to change within and without. So this is the aspect of the true lover or the true believer. So when you start to pursue that path, that's when actually you kind of grow up in a way 
mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally, you realize that, okay, these things that were getting under my skin, now I'm able to understand and be a better man, understand the circumstances from a better point of view. And it ultimately humbles you. Same with the Mason. He knows his journey to smooth his ashlar, to be the master of the way. Same with the Sufi, to become close with his beloved, the grand architect of the universe, the fourth realm, where it's pure energy of love, light, and happiness. And is the whirling dervish who's just swirling in that infinite motion of existence. That's true love, the love of the beloved, the love of God, that the, both the Sufi and the Mason pursue in their life. And what we also mature in our lives through our lessons that we go through. The midwife knows that when there is no pain, the way for the baby cannot be opened and the mother cannot give birth. Likewise, for a new self to be born, hardship is necessary. Just as clay needs to go through intense heat to become strong, love can only be perfected in pain. And that's, I, I really like this because there's a Sufi Sheikh from the Murid Tariqa in Senegal, West Africa, Sheikh Ibrahim Afal. And he says, the harder, the better, meaning that the more trials and tribulations you go through, that means you're in favor by the divine. And a Masonic brother, to make the Masonic reference, Swami Vivekananda, who was a yogi and a great teacher in his own right that inspired Tesla and countless others, also said that, when your life becomes easy, then that means the grand architect or the divinity is not favoring you. So when you're going through difficulties, trials, and tribulations, like the ways of the prophets and the saints and the great masons and believers who have walked this earth before us, just know that that's, you are being perfected from imperfection to the perfection, like the Masonic path. And for the Sufi, him to basically be in a state of fana, the annihilation of self to let go of the attachments of this world, knowing that it's all an illusion. Like it says in uh, Surah 5 in the Holy Quran, that the life of this world is nothing but a game and a deception, but only if they knew. So when you have a, a spiritual path that you're walking, a relationship with a spouse, someone that you love, sometimes hardship is necessary. It's not all, always gonna be fluff and rose and peaches. You gotta go through it sometimes. That's the beauty of it. Oh, I like this one. <laughs> there are more fake gurus and false teachers in this world than the number of stars in the visible universe. Now, this is a thousand plus years ago. How true it is today. Don't confuse power driven, self centered people with true mentors. A genuine spiritual master will not direct your attention to himself or herself and will not expect absolute obedience or utter admiration from you, but instead will help you to appreciate admire, and admire your inner self. True mentors are as transparent as glass. They let the light of God pass through them. Now, this is very true. On the spiritual path, you see a lot of these charlatans that are milking their disciples or taking advantage of them, exploiting them in whatever way, financially, sexually, emotionally, etc very prevalent right now in the Western world, where every, every um, individual who might have that uh, malevolent intention, plus they have that added charisma, kind of makes for a dangerous combo. And I tell people, there is an individual near and dear to my heart. And I told her recently that never let any man or woman, because sometimes women are involved in these schemes as well, with a lot of these cults that are operating, Never let any man or woman take advantage of you or exploit you in any way, shape, or form. Always listen to your intuition and heart, knowing who's right and who's wrong, who's just basically gathering monies or followers, or they have like these uh, different things that they set up too good to be true to kind of make you feel involved. But at the end, you see where it leads up to. So ultimately, you got to listen to yourself and know what to identify as something that's legit or not. And you will know when you're in the presence of someone who is truly representing God, 
or those that are under the guise of religious identities, but in reality, they're totally something else. So be mindful of that. God or the grand architect has given you the intuition and the knowing, the heart and mind to be able to identify these things. So in this journey, you will come across agents of chaos. It's just inevitable. You can't escape it, right? It's the balance of the universe. So that's basically what it's telling you, which is very true even now in the post-2020 world. Okay, so now we move on to try not to resist the changes which comes your way. Instead, let life live through you and do not worry that your life is turning upside down. How do you know that the side you are used to is better than the one to come? So this is basically telling you to stop resisting. What is this definition of al-Islam? Submission to the will of God. And that could be any faith. Like it says in the Holy Quran, Surah 2, verse 62, that whether you're a Christian, Jew, Muslim, Sabian, doesn't matter. As long as you believe in God, do the right thing, are a believer and are righteous, then on the day of judgment, you shall have no grief. The Masonic world is the same. On the altar, everyone is on the level. Everyone is on the level. Everyone will have their own respective volume of sacred law. Everyone is given equal regard. Surah 49, the believers are but one brotherhood. So it's telling you to put your faith in that divinity. What makes you think if something that you lost today, you're not going to get back times 10? I always stood up for the truth. I always stood up for justice. I always spoke up against those that weren't practicing what they preach. What did that get me? Sometimes you got to go through order out of chaos. I did go through some trials. I lost what I had worked for. But guess what? Because my heart was in the right place. I didn't do anybody wrong. I loved everybody. I prayed for everybody. Whatever I, I had lost, I got it back times 10. So always stand up for the right thing. And the divinity is not somebody who forgets. Man forgets when you do good for them. You could do good for them for many years. You just say no one time or forget to do something one time and boom, everything gets washed down the river. But God does not forget. The grand architect holds everything accountable. So always stand up for what's right and you shall never be wronged. Trust me. And never resist any changes. Welcome everything for it. You would not be who you are if it wasn't for things sometimes turning upside down. Okay. God is busy with the completion of your work, both outwardly and inwardly. He's fully occupied with you. Every human being is a work in progress that is slowly but inexorably, excuse my grammar, inexorably moving toward realization. We are each an unfinished work of art, both waiting and striving to be completed. God deals with us, each, each of us separately because humanity is a fine art of skilled penmanship where every single dot is equally important for the entire picture. Again, the rough ashlar being smoothed out to the, uh, to, you know, to, to the smooth ashlar, the mason going from imperfection to perfection in his trust for God, knowing you are the temple to increase yourself in good activities and good deeds every day in your thoughts, in your deeds, in your knowing, in your thinking, in your doing. Is there something that I could have done better, said better, did better? The, and this is all a, um, a spiritual school that we're in. So never think that you don't have a purpose. Everything in this life, the trees, the stars, the moon, yourself, all the beings of this world, Mother Earth and her beings, everything serves a purpose. You would not be here if you did not serve a purpose. Even if your existence is just to exist and your light is holding this, some kind of a spectrum together, then you are serving a purpose. So never feel um, that you are not serving a grand divine's purpose in some way. You definitely are. And be proud of that. Be proud that the divinity is in your heart. You don't have to find it through any special e uh, imam or rabbi or priest or any holy building. It's you. It's your heart. It's your life. You got to find those answers within. And it says in the Holy Quran also that man is responsible for his own soul it says that in surah five that you are responsible so god has given you this beautiful world this beautiful life 
like in masonry, you're taught to make the best of your life and knowledge in your pursuits, et cetera. The Sufi is taught the same. So never think that your life is not of importance. Think of who you were two years ago to the very minimum and look at yourself now. It's a big difference, right? So this picture is continuing to be painted. Like it says that each single dot of your life is important to paint the whole picture. So embrace and be grateful for the past, present and future and all that is yet to come for you. It's easy to love a perfect God, unblemished and infallible that he is. What is far more difficult is to love fellow human beings with all their imperfections and defects. Remember, one can only know what one is capable of loving. There is no wisdom without love. Unless we learn to love God's creation, we can neither truly love nor truly know God. So it's like all of these people that are out there trying to love God, but or claiming that they're godly people, but then they're judging their fellow man. Or if they're a different race or religion, they're ready to condemn you to hell. Like I go to the train station. I see one side of the table that's trying to then converts to one faith. I go and I read their stuff. They're teaching the same exact thing that the opposite table is teaching, but each side is trying to win converts to please their own ego. But why aren't you teaching everybody the oneness of unity of mankind and God and love and humanity? Why isn't there somebody with a table for that? That uh, what Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, from the Sufi point of view said, become one ummah, one community, or that I have come to perfect the character of mankind, their adab. And same with masonry, to perfect one's character, we're all imperfect. Nobody's perfect. We're all facing with our own battles. And we have to do the right thing to achieve that perfection. So everybody's out here being godly, et cetera, but then they're ready to judge other people based on being a different race or religion. You lost a plot right there. Whether you're Christian, Muslim, et cetera, whatever. If you have hypocrisy in your heart for others, then all your worship doesn't count for anything because God knows, the grand architect knows inside your heart. And when the time comes, your heart has to be lighter than a feather. When, it, when the report card gets pulled out after you depart from this life. So do the right thing and love and respect each other. If you love God, then you will respect his beings as well. That's what basically is telling you. Be loving and appreciate the brotherhood and appreciate everything around you. No judgment. Now, again. The next, next rule is pointing out the same thing. Real filth is the one inside. The rest simply washes off. There is only one type of dirt that cannot be cleansed with pure waters. And that is the stain of hatred and bigotry contaminating the soul. You can purify your body through abstinence and fasting, but only love will purify your heart. It's like you get in the shower, you clean your body, but ultimately that dirt inside your heart for others you cannot clean that unless you purify it with love, with understanding. We're one human family, and we're still in a post-2020 world while this world is being ripped apart with chaos, famine, war, poverty, natural disasters. We're still fighting about oh, this race or that, that race or this religion or that religion. It's one. Everything is one. Allah The oneness of everything. And anybody who's separate from that, I don't care what their qualifications are, what titles or acronyms or numbers they have next to their name. They are not serving the correct purpose in the grand scheme of things. They are serving their own ego and their own lower self. So that's what it's telling you. Somebody could be the cleanest person alive, but inside, right? Looks aren't everything. Sometimes you got to look inside. It has to be both beautiful inside and out. That's the most important part of this journey. Continue to work on yourselves and take responsibility for it when you fall short and be the better person. That's what will continue to put you on that path of purification, tazkiyah al-nafs, to clean yourself and the purification of the soul from the Sufi point of view. And of course, the Mason smoothing out his ashlar. The whole universe is contained within a single human being, you. Everything that you see around, including the things that you might not be fond of, and even the people you despise or abhor, is present within you in varying degrees. Therefore, do not look for shaitan outside yourself either. The devil is not an extraordinary force that attacks from without. 
It is an ordinary voice within. If you set to know yourself fully, facing with honesty and hardness. This, this also reminds me of um, what Masonic brother Swami Vivekananda said, that if I realize I, I have this power of divinity within me in my heart, that I'm connected with the Most High, the Grand Architect, then if I look at a person who's of a different race or religion than me, he or she is also a human being like me and has the same quality that I've been created with. So once I realized that, just like how the Sufi says that everything comes from the light and the creation of Nur Muhammad, peace be upon him, then how can you hate anybody? It's as simple as that. If, if you come to that one realization, then you will solve 90% of this world's issues in terms of the, you know, the human conflict that you have to know what is God and what is the devil? Holy Quran says, right? You are responsible for your own souls. You can't blame Iblis or blame Allah or Lucifer or the God or whatever you have it. It's you. Same thing with, you know, in masonry, you get out of life what you put into it. You have to do the right thing while you can. It's easy to blame the, the devil or Iblis or Allah or God for your shortcomings, but you've been given all the resources to do the right thing. So it's you that have to take the responsibility rather than play the blame game or putting the blame on somebody else. So you got to do the right thing. Tea break. If you want to change the ways others treat you, you should first change the way you treat yourself. Unless you learn to love yourself fully and sincerely, there is no way you can be loved. Once you achieve that stage, however, be thankful for every thorn that others might throw at you. It is a sign that you will soon be showered in roses. Great piece of wisdom, right? It's like you have this aspect that if you love yourself, you will not allow, allow yourself to self-destruct in any ways. Now, as an Eastern man from an Eastern perspective, I have seen here in the Western world where single parent homes are very prominent, like divorces, like kids who grow up traumatized because I guess they saw something within the family or something happened, right? Or you have a daughter that's growing up and maybe something happened with the father in the house and now she's on a self-destructive behavior in terms of her relationships and lifestyles and how she's dealing with others. So when you love yourself, that's when you wouldn't have those things happen to you. And when you take responsibility and work on yourself and do the right thing, then you will continue to be showered in roses and become that rose garden yourself. And there's nothing wrong. Everyone has their own path. That doesn't mean that those that are traumatized don't deserve a chance at life. They do. And it's unfortunate they go through what they go through, but it's God ultimately preparing them for the great beings that they are meant to be. So welcome it. Whatever circumstance you grew up in, welcome it. But the, the main lesson that you're getting it here is that in order to find that peace within yourself, love and respect yourself. And when you have that boundary of love and self-respect and acknowledgement of self and working on yourself, like the Sufi and the Mason do, then you're going to be all right. Even if others throw rocks at you or thorns at you, it's continuing to add on to your beauty. So be grateful of that, whether you grew up in a Western or Eastern household. All a blessing, because God is everywhere. Fret not where the road will take you. Instead, concentrate on the first step. That is the hardest part. That is what you are responsible for. Once you take that step, let everything do what it naturally does and the rest will follow. Don't go with the flow, be the flow. And again, <laughs> Masonic point of view, the first step is usually the most necessary one in order to achieve your goal. You have to make the effort to do the right thing in uh, Sufism, you have to go make the step to go see the Sheikh, take the bayat for the tariqa, and then let go of that fear of what could go wrong and only think about what could go right. So if you're in a, if you don't go with the flow and become the flow yourself, how will you progress in your life? 
when you grow up, you go to kindergarten, then you then, then the flow takes you to elementary school, primary level, then it takes you to middle, junior high, then it eventually the cycle of life and the flow of life, then you start becoming an adult, takes you to high school, you finish that, then you go to college and universities, jobs, you marry, you start your own family. So if you just live your life in, this, in the constant fear, it just doesn't work like that. From a Masonic and Sufi point of view, you gotta trust God and go with the flow. Don't don't fear. Don't fear anything. Because it says that in the Quran, right? That Allah guides the true believers from darkness to light. That's both Sufi and Masonic. So trust the higher power and go with the flow. And whatever it is that's necessary for you to achieve that equilibrium in your life, you take it without any hesitation. We are all created in his image, and yet we were each created different and unique. No two people are alike. No hearts beat to the same rhythm. If God had wanted everyone to be the same, he would have made it so. Therefore, disrespecting differences and imposing your thoughts on others is tantamount to disrespecting God's holy scheme. Right? It's like um, what we see in the world going on today. Everyone wants to, right? There's like this thing going on. If you don't believe what I believe, I can't be friends with you. But in the Sufi aspect, they're telling you that everything comes from God. Everything comes from God. The grand architect of the universe, the point within the circle, and the, all the, everything around that circle is a tapestry of different colors and patterns of different cultures, philosophies, ways of life. There's one that's in everything that is to be celebrated, not condemned or controlled in any way. We see this in the world where if you want others to think like you, or there's a lack of a free thinking society, then there is no God there. That's a godless society. And that's the current danger that we're facing in today's world. Where if you don't believe what I believe, I want nothing to do with you. I'm not going to take time to learn other perspectives. That's not how it works from the, either the Sufi point of view or the Masonic point of view. Even in the Masonic point of view that you can't be in your own echo chambers that are confirming your own biases. You have the Masonic double-headed eagle, right? It looks in both directions. God's knowledge and presence is everywhere. When the Sufi prays his five times a day Islamic prayers, he says salam to the both east and west because God is everywhere. So imposing your beliefs on others or all of this stuff, that's why you have a society of free men under free speech to be a free man and to be that free soul. Sufi is a masonry, you name it. Everything requires some type of freedom and you need that aspect in order to ensure that you're not interfering with the grand architect's holy scheme in any way. There is some truth that even in today's world, we can benefit from this. When a true lover of God goes into a tavern, the tavern becomes his chamber of prayer. But when a wine bibber goes into the same chamber, it becomes his tavern. In everything we do, it is our hearts that make the difference, not our outer appearances. Sufis do not judge other people on how they look or who they are. When a Sufi stares at someone, he keeps both eyes closed instead, and instead opens a third eye, the eye that sees the inner realm. So we live in a society where everyone kind of judges you uh, based on what you look like. Before they even get to know you, they already kind of painted a picture of you. And that's not how things should be. That's not how things should be. And if the Sufi is able to look at somebody with that realm of love, knowing that everywhere you go becomes a chamber of God, so too does the Mason. He looks at all of his brothers, no matter if they're Hindu, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, that we're all one brotherhood under the fatherhood of God. And that's with the same essence, that when a Mason sees another Mason, it's so much love, beauty, that it's the last thing that you're worried about is the guy's race or religion because you see a brother on the path. Same with the Sufi. He sees somebody else, he will see them with love and light. That's how it should be in a society that judges you on your appearance rather than sitting down and trying to get to know you. 
I would know this better than anybody growing up as a Muslim in the post 9-11 world in America, that you got to sit down and get to know people and put your biases away that the agents of chaos programmed you to hate others that believe differently from you or look differently from you or thinking that they're out to get you. It's all lies. Trust your intuition. We're all in this together. We're all trying to do the right thing, survive, take care of our families. And we must let our intuition guide us in that aspect. All right. So now we're on this lesson that life is a temporary loan. And this world is nothing but a sketchy imitation of reality. Only children would mistake a toy for the real thing. And yet human beings either become infatuated with the toy or disrespectfully break it and throw it aside. In this life, stay away from all kinds of extremities, or they will destroy your inner balance. Sufis do not go to extremes. A Sufi always remains mild and moderate. So any extremity of any side, it's, it's not healthy for you. You got to realize it's like what it's saying that this world is nothing but an illusion, like it says in Surah 5. And how even in the Masonic path, you're always reminded of your mortality that you're not going to be here forever. The aspect of the skulls, memento mori. So walk and live your life in such a moderate manner that it complements. You don't have to tell anybody you're a Sufi or a Mason. With me, look, I don't wear no shirts, my hat, rings. I define myself as a Sufi and a Mason through my character. When they ask me, who are you? It's your character. There are those who dress like Muslims or who, who wear Masonic rings and they're not representing those values correctly. So, but it's your character. You have to represent yourself in a moderate manner. No extremity of any kind. Like I see these people arguing online about different viewpoints. How are you being an example to the world that is looking up to you? So have that etiquette and common sense. It's uh, the path of the Sufi and the Mason, the true Sufi and the true Mason, I might emphasize. And the human being has a unique place among God's creation. I breathe into him of my spirit, God says. Each and every one of us, without exception, is designed to be God's delegate on earth. Ask yourself, just how often do you behave like a delegate, if you ever do so? Remember... It falls upon each of us to discover the divine spirit inside and live by it. Like it says in the Holy Quran, Surah 2, that you, you are basically God's vice grant on this earth. Almighty God, the grand architect of this universe, Allah, God, in whichever way you perceive it, from the Sufi and Masonic path, you've been given this beautiful world, resources, everything's been given to you. But if you choose not to acknowledge that about yourself and others, then it's like what I said in one of the previous lessons. You can blame Iblis, Lucifer, the devil. You can blame God, Allah, Grand Architect, etc. But when are you going to blame yourself? When are you going to take your own responsibility instead of putting the blame on others? If you've been given this big responsibility of being the highest creation on the basically on the on God's food chain, then you have to act like such. Live your life in a good manner. Stop degrading each other. Stop disrespecting women, men, society in general. You have these industries that are degrading men, women, promoting this abusive behavior in relationships, et cetera. When are you going to speak out against that? When are you going to represent yourself as true godly beings? The aspect of you having this life and making the best of it. But think about it. Hell is the here and now, so is heaven. Quit worrying about hell or dreaming about heaven as they are both very present inside this very moment. Every time we fall in love, we ascend to heaven. Every time we hate, envy, or fight someone, we tumble straight into the fires of hell. That's why those that are on the left-hand path, they're always in a state of anger, hate, fury, those that are on the right-hand path, they're always on the aspect of love, divinity, etc. 
So you have to find that balance in between. I myself am heaven and hell, right? From Omar Khayyam. That you have to find that balance in between. You have both sides, like the Kab Kabbalistic uh, tree. You have the order and disorder, darkness and light. Both are needed because one cannot exist without each other. If light goes away, then darkness loses its purpose. If darkness goes away, then light loses its purpose. We need to basically infuse those things within us, including the divine feminine, masculine, within our own selves, whether you're a man or a woman, or those qualities of the left and the right, infuse that to become the perfect being, the perfect Ashler Stone or the perfect Sufi. Everything is in the now. It's very important. Each and every reader comprehends the Holy Quran on a different level of tandem with the depths of his understanding. There are four levels of insight. The first level is the outer meaning, and it is the one that the majority of the people are content with. Next is the batin, the inner level. Third, there is the inner of the inner. And the fourth level is so deep, it cannot be put into words and is therefore bound to remain indescribable. So now from the biblical point of view, this reminds me of Mark 4.11 where Christ, peace be upon him, said that there will be those of you that will be taught into the inner mysteries that will get it, while the majority of you will be taught in parables in the exterior. In the Sufi point of view, you have the people of the bench, the Suf, the Sufis, who are being taught the inner esoteric uh, mysteries and traditions of Al-Islam, while those on the outside are still divisive and misunderstanding the true message of the Quran. It doesn't tell you to be Sunni, Shia, etc. It's telling you to be a believer. But again, human nature, right? We're not understanding our true nature and we're not realizing our own power and fighting with each other. So it's telling you these four realms of existence that we have, where you have the first realm, which is earth, fire, air, water, uh, the trees, etc. This life that we're in, the 3D reality. Then you have the second realm, which is basically as above, so below, angels, jinns, heaven and hell, etc. Third realm is the source of the lost word, where the 99 names of Allah and the 100th name is missing. The mason is also on that same quest. And the fourth realm is the realm of the grand architect of the universe, or the realm of Allah, that pure, genderless, bodiless form of pure love, energy, and that's exactly what the Sufi is trying to get to, including the Mason, to be reunited with their beloved, the Grand Architect. And you see the dervish spinning in this infinite motion, trying to become one with that oneness. That's what it's telling you, that you got to realize in the grand scheme of things, you do play a role in this reality that we're in and make the best use of your time. And know that there will be those that will either support you or stand up against you. But that's the nature of the game, right? It doesn't matter if you're a Sufi or a Mason. That's life in general. So make the best of the time and challenges and rewards with what you can. The universe is one being. Everything and everyone is interconnected through an in invisible web of stories. Whether we are aware of it or not, we are all in a silent conversation. Do no, do no harm. Practice compassion. Do not gossip behind anyone's back. Not even a seemingly innocent remark. The words that come out of your mouths do not vanish, but are perpetually stored in infinite space, and they will come back to us in due time. One man's pain will hurt us all. One man's joy will make everyone smile. And this, my friends, tells you that no one gets away with anything. Perfect example of this is, are the Assassin's Creed stories, right? where you have one character in the present, the other one reliving the memories of a character in the past, and their stories are interconnected somehow, some way, even there's a gap of hundreds or thousands of years, but there is that web that's tying them together in the grand scheme of things. And esoterically, I, they explain that in a very good way, how we're all kind of tied to each other in some way, shape or form, not to hurt anybody and to love everybody and respect everybody and uh, just live a good clean life live a good life and respect each other like a mason who's supposed to respect his brother in his face and behind his back the sufi in his face behind his back the true believer 
in all aspects, be who you really say that you are. In the Western world, I see you have one mask you wear for work, one mask you wear for your family, one mask you wear for your friends. If you just don't wear any mask at all, I mean, not relating to, you know, the COVID thing, but just like, you know, in the aspects of wearing these different personalities, that you have to be who you really, who you say you are. I'm always myself wherever I go. I don't have to worry about uh, conflicting myself in any way because I'm always, you know, the same person that I am, whether it's in Sufi, masonry, work, home, family, etc. I'm the same guy. That's why I don't worry about anything because I don't have to put on a different face for anybody. And that's where I don't get disappointed because I know what's due for me shall be given to me. That's the beauty of it all. Be held accountable for your actions. No, always do the right thing and don't hurt anybody's heart. Whatever you speak, good or evil, will somehow come back to you. Therefore, if there is someone who harbors ill thoughts about you, saying similarly bad things about him will only make matters worse. You will be locked in a vicious circle of malevolent energy. Instead, for 40 days and nights, say and think nice things about that person. Everything will be different at the end of 40 days because you will be different inside. Now, there's a Sufi sheikh, Sheikh Nazim al Hakani, God rest his soul in peace. And he has said that if you do this also 40 days, and it's also in religious scriptures as well, where the great prophets and saints and messengers that they would go on these 40 day fasts and isolation periods and solitude because 40 is a special number. Even the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, became a prophet at the age of 40. So if you, 40 is like what, a, a month and 10 days, right? A month and like almost a week and a half, something like that. So if you do something like that, where you think good, do good, no good, live a good, clean, respectable life in your thoughts, actions, and deeds, it does change when you're not operating in low vibration behavior or actions and you think good, your life, it does change in many ways. Trust me. Like you have many aspects where they're telling you not to drink alcohol, not to curse, not to watch uh, these different aspects where men and women are being degraded, such as with the uh, adult industry and not to deplete your energy in any way, like the no fat movement. So if you live a good, clean life and you're preserving your life force, you're not harming yourself in any way, do it for a minimum four to six weeks and watch how different you feel. And this is what this is telling you. Don't think about anything bad because then, then you'll be stuck in this energy rut. You're not helping yourself that way. I mean, what difference does it make to anybody if you have something bad to say about anybody? There's about, what, seven billion people in this world, everyone with their own stories and struggles and heartbreaks and rewards and failures. Think about it. With that life, short life that you've been given, you have no guarantee. I could go to bed right now. I might not wake up. There goes my ego. There goes my pride. There goes, oh, this is what I said about who, what, where, and why, X, Y, and Z. Does it matter? Or just make the good use of your time and make your life what you can get out of it from both the Sufi and Masonic perspective. The past is an interpretation. The future is an illusion. The world does not move through time as if it were a straight line, proceeding from the past to the future. Instead, time moves through and within us in endless spirals. Eternity does not mean infinite time, but simply timelessness. If you want to experience eternal illumination, put the past and the future out of your mind and remain within the present moment. So if you really look at it, your past, your present, and what is yet to come, it all happened within your waking sense, which is the now, right? There might be somebody who's watching this video from a different time zone that's nine hours ahead in the future, right? But for me, it's the now. So they're watching it in their time zone, which is probably nine to 10 hours ahead. And we're both existing in that same time and space of watching or enjoying or collaborating or understanding each other, right? So don't think too much 
about what has happened or what's yet to come. Be in the moment, breathe. Just breathe. Sufi, the Mason, the believer, whatever path, put your faith. Have faith in yourself, those around you, your brothers, your companions, almighty God, the grand architect. It all does work out. Stop worrying too much or stop thinking too much. It's funny. Um, <laughs> in the uh, fall of 2018, when I was in the process of getting myself together, I was sitting at the corner of this bus stop, right? And there was a, there was a guy riding a bike. And he went past me and he looked at me and he said, don't think too much. And I still think about that. And I'm like, you know, he's right. Because I was stressing about getting my affairs in order. And he just rides by saying, oh, everything works out. Don't think too much. And he was right. We worry ourselves and we're killing ourselves with stress and these different things, not knowing things do work out, right? So have faith. Have faith. Destiny doesn't mean that your life has been strictly predetermined. Therefore, to live everything to the fate and, do not, and to not actively contribute to the music of the universe is a sign of sheer ignorance. The music of the universe is all pervading and it is composed on 40 different levels. Number 40 again. Your destiny is the level where you play your tune. The mason has to stay on the level. And so does the Sufi. You might not change your instrument, but how well to play is entirely in your hands. Again, don't take life too seriously. Enjoy it while you have it. This one was pretty simple to the point. Tea break. The true Sufi is such that even when he is unjustly accused, attacked, and condemned from all sides, he patiently endures, uttering not a single bad word about any of his critics. A Sufi never apportions blame. How can there be opponents or rivals or even others when there is no self in the first place? All one being, right? Projected in different avatars. How can there be anyone to blame when there is only one? Allah had, Allah. Everything is one. How can I hate him or her when we're both the same exact being operating in different avatars and seeing things from a different point of view? Like Mr. Rogers, right? Puppets talking to each other, but they're connected to the same source. That perfect being trying to understand itself through itself, right? When you have even Ibn Arabi and Baba Muhayyuddin, great Sufi masters who say only Allah can worship Allah. And then all these aspects of finding God within your heart. All pretty self-evident, but people still choose to remain in hatred, which kind of shows that where, where are we really going in the grand scheme of things? But we're taught to have faith in God's plan from the Masonic and Sufi perspectives. Have faith and be happy and keep smiling. If you want to strengthen your faith, you will need to soften inside. For your faith to be rock solid, your heart needs to be as soft as a feather. Through an illness, accident, loss, or fright, one way or another, we are all faced with incidents that teach us how to become less selfish and judgmental and more compassionate and generous. Yet some of us learn the lesson and manage to become milder, while some others end up becoming even harsher than before. So again, you go through these lessons, whether it's the Mason chipping away at his rough ashlar or the Sufi going through his trials and tribulations, you, you realize that everything in your life, like a diamond, everything you're being polished to perfection, like it said in one of the lessons above, that God is painting your picture on the canvas and everything will come to a perfect conclusion one day. It might not make sense now, it might not make sense tomorrow or the next day or the day before, but one day it will click why you went through what you went through, X, Y, and Z, your life, your difficulties, your rewards and challenges. And you will get it. That's the beauty of God, the sense of humor. Nothing should stand between you and God. No imams, like I stressed earlier, and here we are. 
no imams, priests, rabbis, or any other custodians of moral or religious leadership, not spiritual masters, and not even your own faith. Believe in your values and your rules, but never lord them over others. If you keep breaking other people's hearts, whatever religious duty you perform is no good. Stay away from all sorts of idolatry, for they will blur your vision. Let God and only God be your guide. Learn the truth, my friend, but be careful not to make a fetish out of your truths. Right? Everyone that goes around with the moral high ground that I'm right, you're wrong, you're going to hell, my God, your God, etc. Who are you helping at the end of the day? Right? Even spiritual groups where there's an aspect of ego or, or I'm a living God or I'm this or I'm that. Who are you helping at the end of the day while your communities are suffering, your people are suffering, the world is suffering? How's that helping anybody? Of course, there are truths to those different elements and why I do what I do. But if it's from a, if you're making a fetish out of your truths in terms of serving the ego and the lower self, then you're basically idolizing yourself. Stay away from all sorts of idolatry, right? From the Masonic and Sufi paths. Trust self, trust God, and trust those around you. That's all you need. And things do work out. Things eventually fall in place through the good and bad. You will come out better on the other side and give everyone their due regard. Just like from the Masonic point of view, that everyone has a claim upon you. All humanity does. It says that in the Holy Quran, Sufi point of view, that the believers are but one brotherhood. And also another verse, why do you not help each other? All one and the same. While everyone in this world strives to get somewhere and become someone, only to leave it all behind after death, you aim for the supreme stage of nothingness. Live this life as light and empty as the number zero. We are no different from a pot. It is not the decorations outside, but the emptiness inside that holds us straight. Just like that, it is not what we aspire to achieve, but the consciousness of nothingness that keeps us going. I mean, it's the truth. You come out of your mother's womb, nothing, naked, crying. You grow up, you get branded with a name, race, identity, socioeconomic status. You grow up, you're taught to look X, Y, and Z, go through the system, get indoctrinated, get educated. This is your God. This is what you believe. This is what you have to do, work, get a car, job, house, wife, kids, etc. Then you become a complete man. Then you work until you're 65, 70, even after that right now with the current stage that we're in. And just uh, then you die. Then you leave. When they bury you, they'll cry for you, do like a little function for you for like an hour or two at your, at your viewing. People will say some nice things about you. And then people move on. That's the reality of life. An organization you could have been a part of 30 to 40 years. They'll miss you, say some nice things about you. Oh, he did great things. He was a great guy. And then two, two days later, they'll have your replacement ready. Your job, what you were doing, any organization. So just keep yourself humble. That is the reality. Whether you're rich, you're poor, you're white, black, Muslim, Christian, Jew, this is your ultimate reality as the human being, is you're chasing after monies, degrees, titles, cars, accolades, but the real spiritual wealth is what good did you do for yourself and others? In Freemasonry, you're taught memento mori, right? The skulls and the aspect of your mortality. Same thing in Islam, right? It says that in the Holy Quran that we will test you with both good and evil, and to us you shall be returned. When we die, to Allah we belong, and to him we shall return. Inna nillahi, illahi wa rajiyun. Right? That's the reality. It's like with, you know, with the angel of death, during the five daily prayers, visits you five times a day. And each time he asks God, can I take him? He doesn't ask God, oh, he's a billionaire, or he's this, or he's that. Doesn't make a difference. With that one story of the billionaire, when it was time for him to go, and he told the angel of death, please give me more time. What about my wife, my kids, my businesses? He said, you ain't taking nothing of that with you. <laughs> the only thing you're taking with you is what good did you do for yourself and others? And he cried. 
And he realized all these people that I did wrong to get my business going. I threw them under the bus. I did people dirty in business. I lied. I cheated. I stole. Now look at me paying the price. Nobody gets away with anything. So be in that state of nothingness, like the Sufi is in the stage of fana, the annihilation of the self. And that's when not only will humanity respect you, but other beings will respect you as well. Like look at the whirling dervishes in the desert. They could have ghouls around them that would tear your average human being apart. Vampire, angels, jinns, everything that's around them. But that one who's in the annihilation of self doesn't register as a threat or a food source to many of these beings, because they know that this one being, the Sufi master or the perfect Masonic master has ascended above a certain terrestrial sphere where his only concern is God. That's it. Everything else, what difference does it make? The rich person has food to eat, has a bathroom to use, <laughs> has, a, has a bed to sleep in, his needs are fulfilled the middle class or the poor person, somehow, some way, those same things are done for them, their bills are paid, etc. What difference does it make? Be humble. Submission does not mean being weak or passive. It leads to neither fatalism nor capitulation. Capitulation. <laughs> Just the opposite. True power resides in submission, a power that comes within. Those who submit to the divine essence of life will live in un unperturbed, tra unperturbed tranquility and peace. Even the whole wide world goes through turbulence after turbulence. It's like with me. Nothing bothers me. Ever since COVID started before that, I've been all right. I always been good. I always been provided for. I did the best of, of my ability to educate and be with others and help others. So for me, the world is still the same. While everybody's complaining about things not being normal, I always been who I am. And with that, no matter what calamity humanity goes through, for you, it doesn't make a difference because you're operating in the now. You're not wearing any fake personality to get through a certain situation. You just continue to be yourself, your good old self. And, that, and with that divine essence and submission and innocence in your heart, the divine will give you more than enough to make sure that whatever is taking place around you, catastrophic timelines and that, nothing will affect you. So I'm still here in front of you doing what I do. So right with the Mason and the Sufi, trust God. And nothing of this world can do anything to you. In this world, it is not similarities of irregularities or regularities that take us a step forward, but blunt opposites. And all the opposites in the universe are presence within each and every one of us. Therefore, the believer needs to meet the unbeliever residing within. And the non-believer should get to know the silent faithful in him. Until the day one reaches the stage of insane Camille, the perfect human being, from the Sufi point of view and from the Masonic, the perfect Ashler stone. Faith is a gradual process and one that necessitates its seeming opposite disbelief. So you will either be the architect of your own success or the architect of your own destruction. So the Sufi becoming Insan al Kamil or the mason becoming the perfect ashlar stone with his temple, you have to, there will be moments of doubt, suspicion, ego, whispering and agendas of the evil ones. You gotta expel it from your heart, mind, body, and soul and say, this is who I am, this is what I stand for, and this is what I need to do. The Sufi master, Baba Muhayyuddin said that, doubt and suspicion is a cancer for which there is no cure. If you continue to doubt yourself, whether it's with any path you follow, including masonry and Sufism, how will you achieve your uh, culmination to become insan il Kamil or the perfect uh, man or the perfect master? So you got to think about it. There will be moments in life where doubt and suspicion and intrusive thoughts will try to get the best of you, but stand firm in your belief and you shall come stronger on the other side. This world 
is erected upon the principle of reciprocity. Basically, you get what you put into it. Neither a drop of kindness nor a speck of evil will remain unreciprocated. For not the plots, deceptions, or tricks of other people, if somebody is setting a trap, remember, so is God. He is the biggest plotter. Allah is the best of all planners, or the grand architect has the best plan and the best layout. Not even a leaf stirs outside God's knowledge. Simply and fully believe in that. Whatever God does, he does it beautifully, like the great master painting your picture on the canvas beautifully and masterfully like he does with the good and bad added to make that pinnacle of perfection of Insano Camille, of you becoming the perfect Ashler. And basically, that's what it's saying. Your heart, mind, body, and soul, if you keep it in pure thoughts, there's nobody in this world, no matter how powerful they are, or whatever force that they represent, ain't nobody got nothing on you. And I, I attest you. I've been through forms of spiritual warfare. I've been through different forms of uh, dealing with handlers and dealing with, you know, so-called individuals under the guise of friendships and all that stuff. I'm still here. I'm still doing my thing. Those that dig a hole for you, they're falling into their own holes. But as long as your intention is pure, you never thought bad about anybody, you never plotted against anybody, you never did anybody dirty. Majority of the people that I know that did others dirty, they're suffering right now. Either they're dead or they're suffering. And I'm here. I'm happy. I'm doing my thing. So I, I never wore a fake personality, nor did I deceive or talk behind anybody's back. And many people say that about me. Sal, you're still a kid. You have a mind and heart of a child. Maybe that's what might save me in the end. Right. If you look at Nicolas Cage's movie, knowing when the world was about to be purged, who did the angels take up? Who were the kids? So if I have the heart and mind of a, a child or others who say that about me, I receive that with so much gratitude that you can't even imagine, because that means that God is looking out for me. But there is a blessing in everything. God is a meticulous dock maker. So precise is his order that everything on earth happens in its own time. Neither a minute late nor a minute early. And for everyone without exception, the clock works accurately. For each, there is a time to love and a time to die. So everything's got a right time and right place for it. It's like um, the Resident Evil games, right? Or video games in general. You're always going to find the right door, the right item, the right person. The right event will happen at the right time. Why worry? Things do fall in place, right? Have faith, my friends, my Masonic brothers, my Sufi brothers, my spiritual brothers and sisters on the path. Don't be in despair. Even when Moses was on the Red Sea, there was no way for him. God made a way for him, right? So trust the grand architect of the universe. It is never too late to ask yourself, am I ready to change the life I am living? Am I ready to change within? Even if a single day in your life is the same as the day before, it surely is a pity. At every moment and with each new breath, one should be renewed and renewed again. There is only one way to be born into a new life, to die before death, the aspect of death and rebirth which you have in a lot of esoteric circles, Sufi, Masonic, etc. The Prophet Muhammad saying that you have to die before you die. What does that mean? And with, even with Neo in the Matrix, to die before you die. He had, the, the only way he could become the one was through that phase. And that means you have to know that each breath and the aspect of knowing and understanding the great plan of God is to know that everything that has to get broken down gets built back up again, like a phoenix rising from the ashes, roaring in your flames, rising above the terrestrial sphere, being the great being that you're meant to be. Your traumas, your life, however people judged you, your past, does not define who you are. You were meant to go through those things with God painting your picture with the good and the bad. So everything does indeed work out for you so have faith in that have faith in that regard and things do work out <laughs>
that cannot be stressed enough, as you see with the lessons and plus with my thoughts and analysis on it. While the parts change, the whole always remains the same. For every thief who departs in this world, a new one is born. And every decent person who passes away is replaced by a new one. In this way, not only does nothing remain the same, but also nothing ever really changes. For every Sufi who dies, another is born somewhere. The balance kind of stays the same, right? Some things never change. So yes, some things really don't change. There's always that balance and dichotomy of the enough benevolent beings on this earth and the enough malevolent beings as well. There's not, there's not going to be one or less of the other because it's that perfect order and chaos that balances each other out, even on the Kabbalistic tree, that one cannot exist without the other. So knowing that, never be in despair because nothing really changes in the end. It's all one timeline going from it's whatever culmination it's meant to. And like Shakespeare says, we're all actors on a big stage playing our script. And that couldn't be further from the truth. A life without love is of no account. Don't ask yourself what kind of love you should seek, spiritual or material divine or mundane, Eastern or Western. Divisions only lead to more divisions. Love has no labels, no definitions. It is what it is, pure and simple. Love is the water of life. And the lover is a soul of fire. The universe turns differently when fire loves water. So, yeah, I, I dedicate this to somebody who's near and dear to my heart. And I know that the aspect of love always being the answer is the truth. And it's interesting that this is the last lesson that Shams Tabrizi leaves us with, that fire loves water, water loves fire, etc. And that we have the aspect of love. It has no definitions. Love for all, hatred for none. Don't hate anybody. This life is too short. You're not taking nothing with you. No matter how powerful or rich you claim to be or whatever neighborhood you live in, that's only for this life. After that, it de depends on how you carry yourself in this life, which will determine the next phase. So stay true in love. Be a good Mason. Be a good Sufi. Stand up against those who are not practicing what they preach. And things do get better. All right. So I'm going to hit stop share and then I will give you my final culminating thoughts and this will be it. This is this was great. I really loved it. I highly recommend you get a paperback version and support uh, whatever organization or author that's has produced this and I thank whoever put out this free PDF for the aspect of uh, the Shams Tabrizi's 40 rules of love. I am grateful for that. Okay. All right, so again, I hope you were able to take something away from it. And remember, whether you're a Mason, you're a Sufi, any spiritual path you're following, look at all of these great lessons that we learned. And I will put a description of the, of the link of these, uh, the 40 paths, of like a PDF version in the description below. And I uh, hope you liked it. And I wish you all a great, great rest of August and rest of the summer ahead. My love to all of you and your loved ones. Salam alaikum. Peace be with you and yours. And greetings and peace be with all of you. Thank you.